is a that is an interesting uh, part of the story because it's uh, for my generation of social entrepreneurs and 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 technology developers um, we never thought of ourselves as social entrepreneurs okay. or technology developers it just came natural to us okay so that's why it's both art and fascinating when we see social entrepreneurship or ICT for development at uh, being taught at school you know it's been only it's only in the last 10 years that it's finally made it into mainstream academia or even uh, recognized discussions okay. so um i always tell the story I, I get to stanford university invited to be a fellow there as part of the digital vision program okay. and um I was sponsored by Google. There were 16 of us. Okay. It was a select team of, uh, of people from around the world. They had this guy who came to talk to us okay. about social entrepreneurship. Okay. And I remember this other guy, the only other guy from Latin America, he was from Venezuela. He looked at me and says, huh, so that's what we are. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> and, and that's how we learned we were social entrepreneurs. Until that time, we were struggling with the fact that we were making money, but at the same time, we wanted to do good. We felt we were less than the NGOs because we were in business. So yeah. until that moment, we thought that our friends in the in the in the nonprofit world they were like the real deal because they were the ones who were devoted to. To social good. Yes. Huh. Yeah. And, and and we didn't realize that it was we were actually the, the ones leading change. We were the ones actually um, creating a new path, a new way into how to achieve social good with efficiency and and, and innovation. Okay. Okay. But we, we we never set out to do that. We never set out to to be social entrepreneurs. We never set out to. We just thought it was natural. We, we didn't feel um, comfortable asking for people's money. We didn't feel comfortable uh, doing things that uh, were not efficient. Okay. Right. Okay. So, so basically, um, it started by you have, it, it's a call you have in here. Mm -hmm. You want to do something. And when, time, when the time comes for you to do your own thing, you and it's just, I think it's a similar story for many people. You create your own business, okay. but then you don't just want to run a business. You want to do good. Yeah. So many young entrepreneurs either they just run a business and then they set up a special fund for doing good, or they say, "Hmm, and how can we do good while doing this?" Okay. And then it, it, it's it's it comes natural that you combine both things. So so basically, I think. Uh, it's a call you have in you that uh, comes from your heart that you want to change things. And then being an entrepreneur, it's also a, another call you have in you that uh, you're not easily content with what the way things are. So you want to change things, not just society, but you say, hmm, we can do this better. Okay. As a, as a business, that, that's what an entrepreneur does. He sees a problem, or sees a failure, or he, he sees, um, or she sees um, a challenge and says, hmm, we can do this, we can set up a website for this. Maybe it will, maybe it will work, maybe it will not, but we'll do it. So you just go for and do it. And then those two calls, the call to be an entrepreneur and innovate and do things, when, when, when you have that call and it's combined with, it, with the same interest in also changing society, then you become a social entrepreneur because you have no fear. You, 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 you don't think, oh, there's poor people here, there's people who don't have proper housing facilities. Um, it's too difficult, it's not my problem. Yeah. The entrepreneur will never tell you it's not my problem. So you combine both passions and that's, uh, that's how it started for, for most of people in my generation. Right. It's interesting because um, there's there they are stories of failures and mistakes. For example, Educar and Bibliotecas Virtuales, which are two of 
my largest websites. Each okay. of them has uh, one million active users. Okay. Um, I never wanted to do either of them. So I created Civila.com in 1996. May 16, 1996 was the launch date. I know okay. because it was a holiday. I was doing good, but it became too big, too complex, too, too fast. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a virtual community place like GeoCities, and then users wanted more, and users were abusing the resources you were giving them. They were uploading more content at that time. There was not much, uh, not many tools to control okay. what people would upload, load to the, upload to the website. Uh, I wanted to give them all the resources available. So I was struggling with it. But at the same time, we decided, and that's the biggest lesson I learned there, that to create our own content. Although we were a community, a community uh, website or a community network, what actually set us apart was the, our own content, which is now which is now what we call curated content. Mm -hmm. you, you you make your own choice of content and you create it, and then you allow the community you build a community around it. So um, so one of my early one of the co-founders, she came on board in around 1996. She was a teacher. She wrote to me in 1997, right. telling me that she wanted to do something with her with her students, and that if we could give their, we could support what they were doing. And I only saw the message like nine months later. But she was so enthusiastic that I wrote back to her and I told her, you know, anything you want, anything I can do, I'll, I'll be more than happy to personally make sure that uh, yeah. we support that. And then she told me, well, it was last year. Those students have okay. moved on. But then I said, but we can do something more. She was a literature teacher, and she okay. told me, and um, and then she wanted to do something about education. And I said, hmm, education is important, but I don't see what we can do in the education field if we're not a school and we're not um, an education institution. Okay. Hmm. And, but she, she kept saying, we can do something about education. So... Um, so about a year later, so, okay, there you go. And we set up educa.org. Okay. And, she, and I, what I told her, I don't have any time. I don't have time to work on that. I'm focusing in building, building social networks. And she said, don't worry, I will work on it. So she, like a little ant, every day started to work in building educa.org by, by herself. Okay. In less than a year, it was the most popular website. Because it had good content, it was uh, it was built uh, on a very, I wouldn't say naive, but a very um, natural okay. and sincere way. It was built okay. by a six-year-old teacher. Okay. She was like 56 at the time. Mm -hmm. So her choice of content, her choice of words, her choice of everything, and I just made sure that it worked. I did the technical part. She, she did the content part, and then we had other teachers join in and everything. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there was not many. There was not much competition at the time. Mm -hmm. So that's Educador. One of our one of our co-founders. She's um, she's a teacher. Okay. Well, I, I now call her a co-founder. She was not. She came in like a year later, but I because then she she embraced everything we're doing and and and, and, and work on all the other projects. So she said, I want to do education. I said, okay, let's do it. And till this day, it's 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 a site with the, with the most traffic. So she said, wouldn't it be great if we could give people access to books? Because uh, and then she's a she's a teacher from a small. Um, rural town okay. in, in Argentina. Right. It's like five hours from Buenos Aires. Okay. So she said, you know, my students, they don't have access to, to, to books most of the time. So she said, I want to build an online library of books that are on the public domain. And I was like, I don't see any value in it. You know, as an entrepreneur, you're always thinking about what is the value that you're adding. Mm -hmm. If yes. you just, you know, you're just delivering books that people can already download yeah. from other yeah. places. Yeah. There's like, I don't see any value to it. But she kept insisting there is a need for it. There is a need for it. Mm. Because um, if you look for Don Quixote, if you look for Shakespeare, it's, it's not readily available in Spanish yeah. in an easy way to read online. Okay. Mm. And, that, and, and that is also something I learned, you know. There was some, actually something different here. But I didn't know at the time. So in 1998, like six months later after we did, we started uh, Educado or I told, there you go. Here's a website for you to do the books thing. 
we went through 11 years without meeting face to face. Okay. So, but every but we would work every day, and every time we would discuss what the plans are, she would she would she would always bring up let's do the book things, let's do the books things. So in, in about a year after she she had been asking for it, I, I think it was actually for her birthday. Okay. I registered bibliotecaswithpralis dot com, which is a nice name, and I told her and, and I set up the website, I set up the server, I said there you go, now you do your book thing, okay. and it turns out that both of her ideas. Two are two most uh, the, uh, are two sites with most uh, people with with most members, most and successful. they both have uh, one have one point five million, and the other has uh, wow. around around one million active users a month. Wow. So um, the thing is, there was some there is something different about the Glotekas ritual still this day. Okay, okay. It's gonna have to change now. For most people, um, doing digital books, they were either scanning the books. Mm -hmm. And making them available to, for download as PDF right. or ebooks. Okay. We didn't do that. We actually turned them into HTML. Okay. And for for me, it was nonsense. Who is going to sit and read an 800 books on a computer? And we and this is targeting the low end market where people don't have and didn't have. This is 1998. There were no e-readers out there. It was you know, there was no, and people didn't have notebooks, and uh, so people actually were willing to read their books online, and no one was thinking about that, and people still don't think about that, but yeah. it's amazing how we still have, to this day, uh, I've been, I, I tried three times to make our books available for digital download, uh -huh. it, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense. Right. From a, from from an entrepreneurial point of view, because it's a download that consumes bandwidth and doesn't give me anything back. Okay. Now, when people go through El Quijote, which is uh, around nine hundred pages, every page I can have ads there, I can have sponsors there, and I can have the rest of the site where they say, "Hmm, I'm tired of reading this," but they will see something else to read. I can get them engaged. So actually, the online reading experience um, was something that I wasn't thinking about. It was something people were willing to do, and um, and that's probably that's why uh, that's why Bibliotheca Vitralis actually um, became interesting. Also, because since all those uh, ebooks that are available for download, yeah. they're not they're not searchable by the search engines. Okay. So if you look for a book character or a sentence from a book, or you're looking for something specific about a book, what comes up in your Google search is our website because the, the entire text is there. So those were the two things that made it work. And, and at the time, we didn't think of you know I didn't I didn't see any value. So there was actually added value there. I didn't I didn't think there was, but there was. It's just that I didn't see it. And I remember going to this internet conference in Mexico City. And it was like 50 minutes after I arrived at the conference, I already had two friends. Mm -hmm. There were two Mexican guys who came to me and said, Hello, oh, where are you from? And they started talking, 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 talking. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't, they didn't leave me alone for the entire conference. Okay. They took okay. me out for drinking, bars, and everything. And I said, Huh, oh, there's something about this, about that we are. Latin Americans that actually allowed us to connect. Okay. okay. So, and then I had, um, at the time I was sailing a lot. And uh, my mom got, was, she was, uh, she had cancer, so she had to go to the U.S. for treatment. I was uh, left alone in the house for an entire summer. Yeah. And I made a friend from Brazil. Okay, okay. So we started, at the time, you know, it was, it was a mailing list. There was no um, messenger, no nothing. So we started to exchange messages. And three months later, I was visiting her in Rio de Janeiro. <laughs> okay, okay. It was, an, it was a very nice experience. I slept at her house. Her family was nice. Her brother was nice. And I said, huh, people can actually connect. Yes, okay. So it's never been about technology for me. It's always about people and feelings. Okay. I realized by having this experience with Mexican guys face to face and then having this nice experience with this um, Brazilian girl, yeah. a long distance friendship that 
we were talking like every day, and then they said, you know what? I'll go visit you during the, um, during the, it was with Pope Semana Santa, which is uh, Easter week. Okay, okay. So, boom, you know, we, we, we've only known each other for like three months, and then here I am, and it's people just like you and me. And I said, huh, and I didn't speak the language, and I, it didn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. It was mm. it was a family, and then another a, a friend of hers picked me up at the airport, and then mm. they took me to the sailing uh, right. club, and we had fun, and uh, it was nice because, boom! All of a sudden, I'm living in a small Caribbean island with 10 million people, and boom! All of a sudden, I'm in Brazil, which at the time mm-hmm. had 165 million people, but I'm just one of them. Right. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a tourist. I'm one mm-hmm. of them. I have friends. I'm going to their parties. I'm staying at their houses. So, so it, it really touched me how this is. No one had to explain globalization to me. Mm, mm. Okay. It was okay. real on a personal way. I had already had experience with Mexican guys, mm-hmm. and I had visited uh, my friend from Brazil. Yeah. So um, in May 16, 1996, I. I said, I will create a virtual, a Latin virtual cities community. Okay. Because I like your cities, but it was uh, very impersonal and it was very, um, there was like everything there, but there was little Latin American presence. So that's, that's how, that's what Sevilla means, Ciudades Virtuales Latinas. Right. Okay. So, but I created it because I was touched in person by meeting people face to face and and, and, and yeah. online and how that yeah. can change your life yeah. and how it really it really removes any boundaries and any limitations you may have okay. and the the goal was always to share mm-hmm. at the time i felt i was fortunate i was part of a failed initiative there was this company in the in the us mm-hmm. that for $1000 you would get a server I see. Okay. I, I had to pay one thousand dollars to go online, okay. but then I had this server. I paid one thousand dollars for it, and then I had to. Pay. I don't remember. It was very expensive every month. Mm-hmm. But just to get, just right now, you know, it was not just just not the monthly fee, but just to get it, you had to right. pay one thousand dollars. And I had an online server in nineteen ninety six, and I wanted to share it with everyone. I was I was actually giving my. I was very new to, to web programming, so I was actually giving my FTP user and password to people I didn't know. Okay, okay. And it was actually the most beautiful experience of my life. Mm-hmm. For the first 12 months of, uh, of Civila, the content that was generated by users was created, uploaded by users who had the same user and password oh, I had. Okay. okay. Mm-hmm. And I just told them, just make sure you don't post to the root directory because you will that yeah. you will ruin the website. Yeah, I tell them yeah. when you go online, just go to your create a directory. Look, okay, uh, go here. Mm. And these are people I didn't know, people I never met. Mm. I just trusted them, and no one abused it. Okay. No one abused this power, and they uploaded a very very um, interesting content. And there was no security whatsoever. They had my password. I want to put, I had this, uh, this interesting content about 13th century culture in Spain. I said, well, sounds nice. There you go. You have a user and password. And people would be thankful and they never have used it. I was giving my password to people that didn't know. And they could actually wipe out everything if they wanted. Yeah, but sure. no, none, of, none of them did. So those, those for me were real milestones they you know the fact that uh, i was able to meet people face to face and connect with them mm-hmm. that showed me that that reminded me of our humanity right, right. i was right. i was at the time i was um, i was very young and i was uh, focusing in, in building a business but then it touched me that you know people are people mm-hmm. and the fact that uh, the next year the fact that i was able to trust strangers with a user and password Mm-hmm. and no one abusing from it and actually adding value to what we were doing that also changed me a lot follow your heart yes 
follow your dreams, mm -hmm. allow yourself to dream, mm -hmm. listen to others, mm -hmm. but always do what you think is right. 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 If you do what you believe, it might be a mistake, but I don't, I don't consider it a bad mistake. It's a mistake you will learn from and you can grow from. So, so I think it's it, it's about it's, it's follow your dream, and if you don't have a dream, follow your heart. Mm -hmm. Many people don't have a dream, but we all we all know what's in our hearts. Mm -hmm. You can always listen to. You don't know what your dream is, but you know what's in your heart. So, so I think that's the most important. Be authentic. Don't try to be the next Apple. Don't try to be the next Creative Labs. Don't don't you know because you can't. Mm -hmm. Don't try to replicate Silicon Valley. You can't. Just be authentic. Learn from others. Listen to, listen to others, but don't renounce your beliefs. Don't renounce your your guts. That's that's what I think is the most important. And in a global competitive market, yeah. I believe there is a huge. The only competitive advantage we have is the is the added value of local knowledge. Okay. Is the, is the added value of local perspective. You're not going to be you're not going to be able to do something anything better than people in Silicon Valley unless you bring a Singaporean perspective to it. Okay. Because that's your edge. The rest is the same and, and you're at disadvantage. They have more money, access to venture capital, access to uh, amazing teams of people who come from all over the world who are willing to work, you know. You are at a disadvantage, but you have something they don't. You know your audience. Mm. You know your target market. You know, you know. You if you are 25, you know what people who are 25 think about what they want. So I, I always tell this uh, to be it's 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 the it's the competitive advantage of the local perspective and knowledge.